Hello, I'm Malcolm. Welcome to edition 2008 of the Enfield Talking Newspaper. With me on the reading team for Thursday the 9th of July 2015 are Elizabeth, Catherine and Audrey with Ian on the controls. And the items we'll be reading are the copyright of our local newspapers, the Enfield Gazette and Advertiser and the Enfield Independent. This week's local stories include um, the success of a former MP's knife campaign. I felt I had Jenny back again, the story behind a moving BBC One drama. My career in A&E by a retiring worker. And the Stag Brothers to the Stag Rescue. And Stanley and Violet have been having a long and loving ride. But before we go to the papers, we've got one or two reminders and special announcements. And the first thing is, well, many apologies for the problems you experienced receiving your tape last week. The tape was recorded and copied as normal, but due to a mix-up, it wasn't collected until Monday morning. We apologise for the inconvenience caused. OK, um, Elizabeth, you've got something about Sonata. Yes, um, the Enfield Talking newspaper is now available on Sonata. Sonata is an internet radio service developed by the British Wireless for the Blind Fund, specifically for use by blind and partially sighted people. Sonata devices are available to buy from the British Wireless for the Blind Fund and require a broadband connection. Listeners who are registered blind or partially sighted a UK residents in receipt of means-tested benefits qualify for a Sonata device on free loan. This means if you receive pension credit, attendance allowance or a carer's allowance, you may qualify for a Sonata device on the free loan. For more information, please telephone the British Wireless for the Blind Fund on 016 Seven five seven, o one six double two, seven four seven, seven five seven. To experience a sonata in action, please get in touch with your listener's representative, Diane de Jersey, and her number is o two o, double eight o five, six five seven nine, o two o, double eight o five, six five. Seven nine, And now Catherine's got something about a sensory day at Sadler's Wells. Yes, Malcolm, this is for Saturday the 8th of August and it's the Carmen Sensory Dance Experience um, from 10.30 in the morning until 4.50, that's 10 to 5, in the afternoon um, at the Sadler's Wells, Rosebury Avenue, London uh, for people from the age of 12 onwards and it's free to new patrons the timetable of events um, there's a sensory practical workshop that begins at 10.30 and ends at 12.30 with a touch tour at 1pm and then the audio described performance of the Carmen starts at 2.30 to book a place or for more information contact Sadler's Wells access officer with an email Sarah with an H dot howard at sadlerswells.com or telephone 020-7863-8096 that's 020-7863-8096 and in case you were wondering that's the car man it's a, a, a ballet modern ballet by matthew Bourne of new adventures based on the on carmen the well-known opera OK, Audrey, what's this about the AGM? Yes, well, thank you to everyone who attended the AGM on Tuesday the 30th of June. We were rather short of listeners, which is rather sad, because we do like you to join in and let us know how you feel about what we do. But a very special thank you to Ian Bishop Laggett, our recordist for Group D. He drove the minibus and collected listeners from their homes. We do need you to ring in when you need transport next time. Thanks, Audrey. Now, here's something for younger uh, partially sighted and blind people. Uh, it's um, pe- for people with a sporty bent. Tottenham Hotspur Foundation, in partnership with Metro Blind Sport, is offering visually impaired 
mini futsal sessions for 11 to 16 year olds every Saturday at Barnet and Southgate College and that's in the High Street at Southgate. It's weekly every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. As I said, it's at Barnet and Southgate College, Southgate Campus, High Street, Southgate London N14 6BS. And to book, you contact Peter Stone, and his email is peter.stone at Tottenham Hotspur, all one word, dot com. That's peter.stone at Tottenham Hotspur dot com. Or you can call him on 0778 750 4237. That's 077 8750 4237. The nearest tube is Southgate Piccadilly Line, Zone 4, and the Southgate campus is approximately five minutes' walk from the station. And you can get bus W6, W9, 121, 125, 298. 299 and 382. That's mini foot, uh, futsal sessions with Tottenham Hotspur for 11 to 16 year olds. Okay, and I'm sure you know by now that you have a listener's representative, Diane de Jersey, who'll be happy to help you with any problems or concerns you have about your talking newspaper, assuming we manage to get it collected on time. And you can call Diane on 020 8805 6578. That's 020 8805 6578. And now here's Elizabeth with the first of those news items. A former A&E receptionist retiring after more than 40 years has lifted the lid on the stresses and positives of working on the front line. Brenda Smith of Parsonage Lane is set to receive a heroin send-off today at Chase Farm Hospital on the Ridgeway as she retires from 41 years of service. The 75-year-old started as a nurse before moving to reception at the hospital's accident and emergency unit, which closed in 2013. Recalling working there, Mrs Smith told the Enfield Independent, There's a lot of pressure being on the front line and being the first person people see. You have to remain calm and help people because a lot of the time they can be very stressed and I'm the one checking them in. People lose their cool and become angry and there have been times when I've lost it, but on the whole I've tried to remain happy and upbeat and it's lovely to hear people compliment you on how much you've helped them in their darkest hour. The biggest learning curve was learning to work with people and speak to different people every day. When I started I was very shy, but doing this job has meant I've learnt a lot of people skills and made many friends for life. Mrs Smith recalls a tough moment when she was a nurse and helped a woman dying from cancer. She said, I just remember holding her hand and being there for her. You learn how to cope with these sort of things. Mrs Smith and husband Peter plan to relax, but the 75-year-old doesn't know how much she will miss the job. She said, come back to me in a year and I can answer that. Seeing the people will be the biggest miss but I've lots of friends who I can visit, and for that I'm very fortunate. It's been a wonderful 41 years, and has made me an Enfield girl. Like many of us, actress Emily Watson can distinctly remember her whereabouts on July the 7th, 2005, when suicide bombers coordinated attacks across London, killing 52 people and injuring more than 700. I was at home in London, heavily pregnant with my first child, about to go and get the tube, recalls the 48-year-old, who grew up in Islington and is known for her roles in Angela's, Angela's Ashes, Gosford Park and, most recently, a royal night out. We turned on the radio and heard there'd been an incident. I remember so much confusion and then the chilling moment when the bus explosion came. A power surge became London was under attack. At first, the explosions were thought to be down to a power fault before the full horrifying picture emerged. Although Emily, who has two children with actor husband Jack Waters, wasn't directly affected by the attacks, she felt a call of duty to accept the role of a grieving mother in A Song for Jenny. The standalone drama is based on the memoir 
by former vicar Julie Nicholson, whose 24-year-old daughter Jenny was killed in the bomb blast at Edgware Road tube station. Adapted by the Irish playwright Frank McGuinness, it captures the twist of fate that saw Jenny take the circle line that day and traces her mother's response from the moment she hears about the attacks to the news that her daughter is missing and then the confirmation that Jenny is among the dead. Obviously, there are many stories from that day, each unique, remarks Watson. Julie is a natural storyteller and, very significantly, a priest who lost her child to what purported to be, however twisted, a religiously motivated act. Her religious faith was very shaken and she's no longer a priest. And though in honouring her daughter she drove herself to the edge, staring into the dark abyss, ultimately she chose humanity and chose love over hatred. The bereaved mum admits it was tough to give the book over to strangers, but says, I felt privileged that someone else wanted to tell my story and Jenny's. Nicola Wren, who was eventually chosen for the role, was straight out of drama school, which I felt Jenny would have approved of, notes Julie. As to how she felt having Emily Watson, a two-time Oscar and four-time BAFTA nominee, playing her, Julie says, blessed. I believe it was important that whoever played me should be a mother and understand viscerally the powerful bond. Emily is an extraordinary and courageous actor who takes risks. Her stillness and quietness is as powerful as her actions and spoken words. There were times when I didn't know myself if I was watching Emily or myself. A Song for Jenny is available now on BBC iPlayer. Nicola Wren will be appearing in her Edinburgh preview play 501 Things I Do in My Bedroom at the Etc. Theatre Camden on July the 21st and 22nd at 9.30pm. Lovely, wasn't it? A shared love of cycling brought a couple together more than 70 years ago and they have kept their love alive for all that time, even after upgrading their pushbikes to a motorbike and sidecar. Stanley Nye, 92, met Violet, 93, in 1938 when they were both members of the same Edmonton Cycling Club when he was just 15 years old. They started out as friends, but romance soon blossomed until the outbreak of World War II in 1939 when their plans to spend their lives together had to be put on hold. We always said we wouldn't get married until the end of the war, Stanley said. Stanley served in the Army Medical Corps during the war in the field of um, in the field ambulance on the front line. Months after the Allied victory in Europe in May 1945, he walked up the aisle with Violet on his arm on July the 21st. Even when the couple started a family after setting a home together, they kept cycling, venturing into the countryside with their young son Peter popped on the back of one or the other of the bikes. But all good things come to an end. When he got too big, that's when we decided to get the motorbike and sidecar. The couple moved into their Winchmore Hill home 48 years ago, and after 25 years as a butcher, Stanley changed his career, setting up his own decorating business. He's been pretty good, Stanley said. We've had our ups and downs like any other couple, but the secret to staying together is to get along and share any problems If you talk it through, you can come out the other end. At the standout highlights of the, and the standout highlights of the past 70 years. Well, that would be the grandchildren, Stanley added proudly, about his 32 year old granddaughter Carmel and 26 year old grandson Maxwell. Repeat offenders found carrying a knife face an automatic jail term when a new act dubbed Enfield's Law comes into effect next week. Championed by former Enfield North MP Nick Dubois, who lost his seat in May, it goes onto the statute books just as he's getting used to a new life away from Westminster. The 56-year-old was celebrating this week that his term in Parliament will leave a long-lasting legacy that will save lives. The Ministry of Justice announced on Friday that, as of July the 17th, anyone found to have repeatedly carried a knife will be jailed automatically. Mr Dubois, who's now managing Zach Goldsmith's bid to be the Conservative London mayoral candidate in next May's election, brought the measure forward as an amendment to the Criminal Justice and Courts Act after he became concerned about the high numbers of young men in his constituency being stabbed. 
under the new law, which was passed in February, adults convicted, convinced, sorry, adults convicted of more than one count of being in possession of a blade will not be able to evade jail and will have to spend at least six months behind bars. Teenagers under 18 will be forced to serve a minimum four-month detention and training order. Last year, 1,300 people were only cautioned or given non-custodial sentences for knife offences. Under the new law, they would all have faced prison time. Speaking to the advertiser after Friday's announcement, Mr Dubois said, No one should be in any doubt that this law means you will go to jail for at least six months if you're caught carrying a knife for a second time. The message should be loud and clear. We won't tolerate carrying knives any more. Let's not forget that to kill someone with a knife, you have to first carry a knife. And I hope that the true legacy of this law that I was able to secure is that it will save lives. Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Bernard Hogan Howe said, Knives kill. People carrying knives are a threat to all of us. My officers see that at first hand. A simple guarantee that you will get locked up worked for guns, and I believe it will work for knives. Putting this legislation forward is an important step, and I have made no secret that I support this move. It was supposed to be a warm-up for a stag weekend in Benidorm, but a night of karaoke for two brothers ended with them saving 14 people from a pub fire. A taxi was due to collect John Doyle, 27, who's getting married in September, as well as his brother Toby, 23, and six other friends at 4.30am on Friday as they prepared for a boozy weekend on the Costa Blanca. Yet the night was to take a strange twist hours before leaving when Toby noticed smoke coming from the back of the stag pub, pub in Little Park Gardens, Enfield Town, next to his home. I thought Toby just had just had one too many and was seeing things, said John. But then we realised the fire was getting worse and ran as fast as we could to the pub to alert the people staying in the guest rooms above. Bewildered by the early morning cries of fire from the brothers and their friend Steve Vigor, who was staying, who was, those staying in the rooms had no idea of the fire at the back of the pub. John said one man was just saying, I'm too tired, when we told him he had to get out, but he was having none of it. Eventually, realising the peril, the 14 staying in the guest rooms attempted to escape, but the door at the top of the stairs was locked. With no way to the fire escape, as it was blocked by the fire, the brothers took drastic action. Toby said, I punched a hole in the glass above the door, but I couldn't get it open. So we picked up a plant pot from outside the pub, threw it at the window, which smashed. <coughs> Excuse me. I jumped through the broken window to open the door and get people out. I wasn't thinking clearly at all. Following the dramatics, the 14 people living in the pub all made it out unharmed and the fire brigade battled the blaze. The stag party then packed the bags and headed to Spain for the stag weekend. But the drama leading up to it will live long in the memory. John said, it was a great weekend, but it didn't start how I thought it would. The stags, saving the stag, is something we will talk about for years to come. Mm. Fears are growing of a rise in waiting times as beds are lost at a hospital. Chase Farm Hospital currently has 68 surgical beds, but the number is said to be reduced to 52 following the £120 million redevelopment by the Royal Free London NHS Foundation Trust, which took over its running last year. The hospital used to have 456 beds when A&E and maternity services were on its site in the Ridgeway, comparable to Barnet Hospital and North Middlesex University Hospital in Edmonton. But following the closure of the A&E unit, a further reduction of the inpatient beds has infuriated Enfield North MP Joan Ryan. She said, I was amazed at how small it was. Not only has A&D gone, but all the big surgery has already gone to Barnet. The new hospital will not be replacing like for like. To have just 48 to 52 beds makes it a cottage hospital, and it's not what the people of Enfield deserve, she said.
Eventually, people will have to wait longer for a bed, and there just is not enough. The time you wait for an operation will increase too. I am concerned that, with three years to go until the scheduled completion date for redevelopment, these plans could get even smaller. But I'll be fighting for every bed and square meter at Chase Farm, and I will continue to campaign to protect the hospital from any more cuts. The hospital will sit on a 22,000 square meter site, with a school and new housing being built on the site. A spokesman for the Royal Free Trust said, "The new Chase Farm Hospital will have 96 beds, 44 for rehabilitation inpatients, and 52 surgical beds. The trust is currently commissioned to provide the same number of rehabilitation beds, and there are currently 68 surgical beds." Work to determine the number of beds needed has been clinically led, taking into account the current and future health needs of the local population. The new hospital has been designed to allow for significant expansion in response to evolving health needs, so more beds can be accommodated in future. A deaf and blind student has begun verbally communicating with his peers after excelling at tennis on a program to help young people with disabilities. Michael Angelo Gomez, 24, has limited sight in one eye and relies on a specially designed hearing aid. But the Tottenham man is said to be making astonishing progress as one of 30 students attending the course at Aldersbrook Tennis Club in Wanstead. Due to the severity of his disabilities, his tutors at Waltham Forest College said they were concerned he would not be able to play. But Michael Angelo's determination and focus means he is now striking balls with remarkable proficiency, and his success on the program is said to help give him the confidence to verbally communicate. Michael Angelo said, "I can see the ball a little, just enough. I love tennis, and I really enjoy playing." His class teacher Amy Ayres said the course has proved invaluable in raising Michael Angelo's self-esteem. He's talking more and joining in more. She explained, before he would not want to talk and would prefer to sign. Now he is using more varied communication with us and his peers. He is using the same equipment and following the same instructions as the others, and feels he is no different to them when he is on the court. A care home had cause for double celebration when it reopened and launched its own songbook. Nan House Care Centre in Forty Hill, Enfield, has undergone a six-month refurbishment, and to celebrate, residents have selected 200 of their favourite songs for the new book. Residents clapped and sang along to their favourites as Mayor of Enfield, Councillor Patricia Akechi, formally cut the ribbon to welcome people to the refurbished home. Guests enjoyed food and drinks along with live music from residents and music therapist Phil Evan Evans. The name of the songbook, "Give Us a Song," comes from a phrase used by Bridie, a resident in the home. According to Mr. Evans, it would be the first thing she'd say whenever someone new walked through her front door. Manager Rosalind Maxwell said, "We think our transformed home looks fabulous, and more importantly, so do our residents. So we're delighted friends could join us to celebrate its completion." A man who helped to school. From the brink of special measures to a good Ofsted rating, has been honoured with an award. Keith Carano was asked to become a governor at Highland School in World's End Lane, Enfield, 16 years ago, when his son was among the school's first pupils. He was asked to help Garfield Primary School in November 2013, after it received a requires improvement rating from Ofsted, and is now its chairman of governors. The 56-year-old was last week presented with an outstanding school governor award at the Enfield Annual Governor Awards. Mr. Carano said, "I'm pleased to be recognised for the work I've done. I'm privileged and honoured by the award." He said, "Initially, I wanted to be involved and give something back. I was a youth worker in my younger years. My children were at Highland School. I stayed because I loved it." You do have to commit quite a bit of time for evening meetings, but it is about commitment. The governor was shortlisted with seven other hopefuls and said receiving the award was one of his best moments. 
Mr. Carano was keen to encourage anyone considering becoming a governor. He said it's rewarding. What better than helping the young students of Enfield? Councillor Afa Oram, Enfield Council's Cabinet Member for Education, Children's Services and Protection said, We can thank all our school governors for the endless hours they spend ensuring that our schools meet exacting standards, that budgets are in order, that school premises are in good repair and that our children learn from inspired teachers in safe and secure surroundings. And a kind of link to that story now. A reading challenge in Enfield this summer could help break a world record. At the launch of the Summer Reading Challenge 2015, children will take part in a nationwide attempt to break the world record for the most number of book reading pledges received as part of a campaign. The event's organisers have teamed up with the Guinness World Records, publishers of the annual Guinness World Record books, and are encouraging children to discover some of its weird and wonderful entries. Summer Reading Challenge 2015 starts on Saturday and runs until September the 13th. It is aimed at children aged between 4 and 11. Ifa Orhan, Enfield Council's Cabinet Member for Children's Services, said... During the challenge, children are encouraged to read six or more library books of their choice in the summer holidays, collecting rewards along the way as they read each book. There is a certificate and medal for every child who completes the challenge. Children can sign up at any library in Enfield during the summer holidays, it's absolutely free, and preschoolers can take part in Toddle Into Books. This is all about making reading fun and establishing a good habit for life. Last year, more than 3,000 children in Enfield took part. For further details, go to www.enfield.gov.uk forward slash library forward slash SRC or go to your local library. An 18th century obelisk marking the former boundary of Middlesex has been rebuilt. The stone in Southgate Green was destroyed several years ago but has now been reinstated by Abacus Stonemasons after a campaign by Southgate Green Association. A sketch 80 years ago shows the obelisk standing in Waterfall Road, Southgate, next to Ivy Cottage, which was demolished to make way for housing in Waterfall Close. Chris Horner of the Southgate Green Association said, this is an example of the local community caring for the environment. And so we've come to the end of side one. Please stop your machine, take out the cassette, turn it over and start side two. <laughs>